um, we're at, uh, almost at the end of a series uh, of what we have been calling Everything You Need, Nothing You Don't. And we've used these suitcases as an, illus- as an illustration that what do you really need when it, when it comes to this issue of relating with God? A- and how do we earn his favor? In fact, these are the questions we've been asking. Uh, uh, what does it take to satisfy God? What does it take to really please God? What does it take to ju- be justified before God? What does it uh, take to be in right standing with God. And, and really what I think we're finding in here in Galatians is it's pretty, there's just a few core things, a few small things. But we have a tendency in Christianity to add all sorts of stuff to it. And we make it this hard, this big, and we add all these things. And we're trying to make it clear that that's not really true. That it's, it's by grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone. Nothing more. It's not all the added on stuff. Uh, that's really what the gospel is. We've been fighting for that. We want to fight for that still. Uh, and so really, uh, we've been asking these questions, kind of another way to put it is, how can we make it right with God and how can God make it right with us? It's a really pretty simple thought, isn't it? Pretty basic though. How do, how do we make it right between us? Um, and, and really, Galatians has been all about this. It's been a journey of seeing what the truth of the gospel looks like theologically and practically. And the great thing is in the last few chapters, we've been talking a lot about what does it look like practically in real stuff. What do we do to make a difference? This week, I think, is going to be really important, really helpful, really motivating, I think, for you. Uh, and, but here's kind of an overview of what we've done. If you haven't been here, you, you, you could have missed the whole thing, and it's okay, because here's the rundown really quickly, okay? First of all, grace is scandalous. It's given to people who don't deserve it. That's a scandal. We only give things to people who deserve it, right? You know? And so, but God gives grace to those who don't deserve it. It's a scandal. Secondly, it's amazing what it does in the life of a person. And here, in the life of Paul, what it did in his life, having been uh, a Jew of Jews, a Pharisee of Pharisees, and just one who is persecuting the church, that he meets Jesus on the road to Damascus, and he radically changes his life, totally turns it around, turns it over, turns it inside out, inside out and upside down, and it really changes his life. Next is that grace is vulnerable. It's easily messed up. It's easily destroyed, in a sense, by other things. That's what's happening in in Galatia, is that there were people coming in and saying, hey, it's not enough. You need to do this. You need to do that. You need to to, to obey the Mosaic law. You You need to get circumcised. You need to do this in order to really do it. And Paul just cringes, and he says it's not true. Next is that grace is rooted. It's rooted in the depths of what God has been doing from the very beginning. It's rooted in what he's been doing in the life of Abraham and ever, ever since that. It's a redemptive history that God has been doing. It's rooted. And not only that, but it's grounded. It's grounded in the character of God himself, in who he is. Wow. It's also very relational. It allows us to come and call God Abba Father. The most intimate of things to say, our daddy not disrespectfully, but very personally. Second is God, is, it's very intimate in our lives. It goes to the core of who we are. Next, we talked about the fact that it's kind of familial or it's family-ish. Uh, it, it's about the, what he does in the midst of us. Second, next is that grace is about freedom. It really sets us free. When the law is safer, it's really easier to live by rules, isn't it? Then we, we can check it off. It feels secure. Problem is we can never check them all off because we mess up. Freedom is kind of scary. But that's what he sends us to is he gives us freedom. It's the grace of God. Next, that the grace really is all about love, that we would love our neighbor as ourselves. That's what he says it was now. Next, that grace is about conflict. There's this conflict that goes on in our, in our, in our experience between the flesh and the spirit. The flesh calling us to kind of satisfy these sinful desires in our lives and the spirit who calls us to really obey him. Wow, that's incredible. In fact, it looked like this at the end of last week's passage. It says, if we live by the spirit, let us also keep in step with the spirit, to walk in the spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another, which so easily happens, doesn't it? It's so easily where we go. But here he says, I want you to walk in the spirit, keep in step with the spirit. To, and because that's how where you find real life. Now, this week, what we'd like to talk about, well, in fact, before that, to walk in the Spirit, we talked about this last time, that it's not a mystical or a magical deal. It's not a mechanical deal, but it has some elements to it that are very real, 
the elements of confession, of saying to really walk in the Spirit means I need to confess, agree with God about what he says about my life and about my sin, that it's wrong. Secondly, to repent, to turn. Say, man, I've been headed this way and I know it's wrong and it's not getting me anywhere good. In fact, it's really destroying life and the li- not only my own, but the life of others. And I need to turn and I need to walk back in a new direction. I need to commit myself to this. And, then, and second, third is a, a really exercising faith, believing God, not earning, not living by faith, but living by faith. And last, that you would be in God's word, that it would enrich you to walk in what that's all about. Well, this week I want to talk about this, the fact that grace is very practical. Grace is very practical. And today it's going to get really practical, okay? Because th- today we're going to talk about this. We're going to talk about relationships and resources is what he's going to talk about. Relationships and resources. Because the, sp- the spirit-filled life eventually gets down to that. It really real stuff about how we treat each other and how we interact with each other. And what do we do with the resources that God has given us? It's going to address that. So let's start with uh, relationships and, and see what he has to say about that, okay? Here we go. Verse number one. Brothers. I love this. Brothers. It's a very kind, it's a very warm address. He's dealt with some pretty tough things. He has said some pretty hard things to the people so far in this letter. But he says, I want you to know brothers. And really, uh, this whole, in the Greek, this would have really included sisters. So this wasn't just like, okay, bros, we're talking to you. Uh, it's not, no, hey, family. This is family, brothers and sisters. If, now look at this. If anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. That if is not a conditional if, it's like a guaranteed if. It, when you are caught in any transgression, doesn't mean that we catch each other. It means when we find ourselves trapped or caught in a transgression, a sin, a pattern, things that are not so great. You know what I'm talking about. Been there, done that, get it, whatever. It says, when you are caught in a transgression, someone who is living in a sinful place, it says this, you who are spiritual. Normally when we think about the person who is spiritual in the face of someone who is sinful, often I think we picture, well, then what you need to do is you need to confront it. You need to nail it. Or we think about you need to deny it, overlook it, act like it's not real. Both leaves that person either in a place, in a place of shame, right? Shame because you just nail them to the wall or shame because they're left alone in this sinful place, this painful place, this destructive place. And so he says, if you're really spiritual, here's what you ought to do. You should restore him. To restore, to make new to make clean. It, one of my favorite things in TV is to watch is uh, some of those, uh, those shows about restoring old cars. I don't know if you guys ever watch that, but there are these series of shows uh, about restoring older cars. I love it. Man, they do incredible things to these cars. And when they get in there, thing it's rusty, it's broken. They replace things. They fix that. They make it all brand new. It's like the coolest stuff. Uh, And that's what I think of. You should come in and restore and make this rusty pile of bolts and and screws and make it brand new. To restore this person who's been hurt with a spirit of gentleness. To restore them. That's got to be our spirit in it, is gently to restore. Because things get beat up, don't they? People take a beating in life after a while. One of my favorite films is the film Sea Biscuit, and in Sea Biscuit, it's all in the 1930s when America was coming through not only the Great Depression but what we call the Great Recession that happened right after the Depression, and there were things were really hard. Unemployment was 19 percent in the United States. It was a brutal time, and it was a country that was looking for hope. And there came along in true history this this horse named Sea Biscuit, and Sea Biscuit was kind of a a small beat up little horse. Uh, that really had been given up on by most people, but there was this one horse trainer named Tom Smith uh, who said, this horse can do it. And a guy named Charles uh, Howard bought it because he had the wealth to do it, and he got Tom Smith to uh, train it, and he hired a guy named Red Pollock to be the jockey. Red Pollock had been through his own difficult things, but eventually Seabiscuit was becoming a very winning horse. And in 1937, he ran in what's called the Santa Anita Handicap. It's called the 100 Grander, because then you could, if you won it, 
it was 100 grand. Just so you know, today it's a lot higher than that. Um, and, and so, I mean, Seabiscuit is doing awesome. And then he comes into this race, this key race that he's supposed to win. And then there's this horse called Rosemont. Well, probably if you watch it, it'll, it'll, you'll get it better. It's a great thought, isn't it? You don't throw a whole life away just because it's banged up a little bit. Somehow the Christian army is the only army in the world that kills its wounded. And that we ought to have a kindness about us, a gentleness about us to restore people who are banged up a little bit. I think that's what Jesus is calling us to do. I think that's what Paul's saying here, is when we find someone who's been caught in a transgression, those who are spiritual ought to restore them with a spirit of gentleness. I love that in Charles Howard's voice there. It's fine. It's fine. You don't throw a whole life away because it's banged up a little bit. Which Red Pollock had been beat up in an accident during the training. He'd lost the sight of his right eye. He couldn't see Rosemont coming. Feels like our lives, doesn't it? Well, it goes on in the last part of the verse there. It says, keep watch over yourself, lest you too be tempted. Right? Let's not be too quick to judge too harshly, too hard, too much, because we too can be caught in the same temptation. Well, there's a humility here in this whole thing. And then look in verse 2. It says, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. There is a key thought here um, in this whole thing is the, the word for burden here is the word bar, from which we clearly get burden. It's, a, it's the Greek word bar, which means heavy burdens more than someone should carry. He's calling us that when we're in life and there are people who are carrying something that is too hard, too much to carry alone, to come alongside one another and help carry one another's burdens. Because there are certain things that are just too much, too hard, too heavy, to do alone. We were never made to do them alone. We were made to do it together. And sometimes you just need to reach over and carry that burden with the other person. And there's a lot of them in life. We could go, we could go walk around the room and we could define those, describe those, share those. And I think our hearts would be so grieved that we would probably either just run away or we would step in and we would help one another. And this is the law that fulfills what Christ is all about. Not obeying the law of you've got to do this and this and this and this to be religious. But to be this and this and this for the cause of Christ in our lives. The love that he has, the graciousness that he has, and what he has called us to in each other's lives. Wow. That's pretty practical. It's pretty real. That in the midst of real life that we would carry one another's burdens with each other and for each other, that we would do that. Now, he, he makes a couple of comments here about this, in a sense. He says, look in verse 3, For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Really, he's saying, if you think you're too good to do that, if you say, hey, you know what, I'm better than that. I'm higher than that. I can't reach into that. You're too low for that. I'm not going to ever lower myself to help this person who I think I want to really be critical of. He says, you deceive yourself. Uh, you're... you're you're wrong. It, it, no one's that way. Christ reaches into the depths of the lowest of low, right? That's where he found me, in the lowest of low. That's where he finds that. And so if you think you're something when you're not, you deceive yourself. And look at this in verse 4. But let each one of us test his own work, and then uh, his reason to boast will be found in himself alone and not in his neighbor. What he's saying here is don't compare yourself to others. You know, if in verse 3 he's saying... Uh, if you think you're too much, well, you're wrong. And he's also saying, don't compare yourselves to others and what they're doing. You, you just land where you need to land. Do what you need to do, not what the person next to you is doing. You might go, well, they're giving so much more time and so much more money and so much more this and so much more that. Well, it's not about them, right? It's about what God has called you to do. And so it's not a comparison game. It's not like, oh my gosh, you know, it's about what you do and what he's called you to. And so that you can boast, not in an arrogant way here. This boast is that you could be, you could be proud of, what, of having accomplished what God called you to accomplish, what he asked you to do, not the other person to do, what he asked you to do. 
I, I kind of compared myself this week, or at least I compared Quest a little bit to what's going on in Ferguson. And I, I heard of this church is doing that, and that church is doing this. And, and I thought, golly, we're not doing those things. Maybe we ought to get doing that. But, that. but I thought, what's God called us to do? What has God called me to do? And maybe I, I know what he's called us to do in our hearts, but in the practical ways, I don't know for sure yet. We're going to figure that out, what we do with this whole thing. But, but it wasn't about them. It was about what God had called us to do and that we could be satisfied and pleased with what God having been accomplished or having been obedient to what he called us to do. And that's what he's saying here. And that we're not comparing ourselves to our neighbor in all of this. And then, look at this in verse 5, he kind of wraps this up with the whole thought, for each will have to bear his own load. And you think, well, I thought you just said we have to bear each other's loads. And here he says, for each will have to bear his own load. Now, here's, here's the deal. Uh, in the Greek, this word for the load, for the burden to bear, is a whole different Greek word. It mean, it's portion, which really is from which we get the word portion. Uh, and it really means this, that it, it's a common term for a man's pack. In other words, there's a part of things in life that God has given us to carry in our backpack that is our responsibility to carry. It's what he has called us to do. It's the what you are supposed to do and not what you're not supposed to do. It's, it's carrying what he's called us to carry. There are some times that life gets so heavy, back in verse 2, that it's too much for a person. And that's where we come alongside one another and help with the burden. But there's a part of it that we're, that we're supposed to carry. Be obedient to the Lord to be responsible for. And that's what he's saying to them. You'll have to bear your own load in that. Don't expect everybody else to do what God has called you to do. You just be responsible for that and be satisfied with it. Whatever it is that God has called you to do. Okay? It's all about those relationships, understanding it. It's really the difference between dysfunctional and functional, right? When you get those two mixed up, something you should do for someone else and something you ought not to do for something else, you need to do it for yourself. When you get those all screwed up, it's called dysfunctionalism. And we need to be a very functional group of people and knowing, yes, I need to help at this point. Or no, I don't need to help. That's their load. They need to carry it. I need to let them be responsible because in that place, they'll grow and become stronger. But there are other places that are far too heavy. <sighs> On one evening out of the week, I meet with a group of men who are going through some unique things in life. Very hard things. They are things that are too heavy to do alone. And over the last several months, that place has become sacred ground for me. It's almost like I feel like I should take my shoes off when I go in there, though that would be very inappropriate. Um, uh, <laughs> but it's like walking into sacred ground, to holy ground, because these guys are now sharing some very heavy things. It's too much to do alone. There's part of it they carry by themselves, but it's part of they do with, other, with each other. It's been one of the most phenomenal things I have ever experienced. Now, it's not perfect. We're a bunch of, we're a bunch of knuckleheads, you know, that get together. But uh, there's something profound going on. And it's, and it's like living this passage out. It's been phenomenal. Well, not only in the relational world, but let's talk a little bit about resources, too. Because I think he calls us to the very practical place of resources. Uh, look at this in verse 6. Let the one who has taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Now, I, I separated this because he's talking financially here, and much of this passage has to do about financial resources, but I think it goes beyond that. It goes to time and talents and not only our treasures. But this one is unique, and I just want to say personally thank you. On behalf of myself and really the rest of the staff that you support financially, to let the one who has taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Now, initially, Paul was a tent maker, right? He, he, he went in and he said, I don't want you to pay me a dime. I'm going to make tents. But very quickly, uh, even before Paul and after Paul, very quickly, there was this group of people who took responsibility to teach the church God's word and try to help them along in understanding truth. And he says to share with those. And I just want you to know, you do that with me. And you do that with the rest of the staff, that you share with them. And I don't know if we could ever tell you how much we are grateful and thankful. And really, it's very humbling. It's very humbling, but it's also a privilege. And I want to say thank you uh, on behalf of the staff. But then he goes on in verse 7. 
And he says this, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. And let's circle this next thing. For whatever one sows, he will also reap. There's a fundamental human principle of how life functions is that you will reap what you sow. There are, there are um, uh, things that happen as a result of what you do that's real. And, you, and, and, and it's just that, that's the, way, the truth of it. Whatever one sows, you also reap. Now, we're talking in a sense here of the financial world, but this principle goes beyond that, right? But he's really saying here, and this whole context is a little bit more financially, where you're investing your time, talent, and treasures, there will be a reaping of how you do that. And what are you giving yourself to in your time, in your talent, and your treasures? Where are you giving it? Because there will be a reaping. Now, let's go on and, and see what that looks like. It says, for the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. Ooh. I don't know about you, but don't we really want to have sin be a freebie? We really do. We don't want consequences. We don't like consequences. Well, consequences are not very fun. But the reality is that there are consequences to our sin. And here it says the consequence of your sin is corruption. The corruption of your own soul, the corruption of your own mind, the corruption of your own family, the corruption of your own neighborhood, the corruption of your community, the corruption of your city, the corruption of your nation, the corruption of a world. That's what happens when sin happens. When, when we sow to the flesh, we destroy that which ought not to be destroyed, which shouldn't have been destroyed. Isn't that really what happened in the garden? When they sinned, they messed it all up. A famous speaker once said, sin ruins everything. Here's the unfortunate truth. That is true. Sin ruins everything of value. And that's where we live, in a world where that has happened. But let's go on here, and it says, not only that, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And he's not talking about just heaven. He's talking about right now and all the way through eternity, including heaven. But what eternal life doesn't start when we die and go to heaven. It starts now. Right now is when eternal life starts. And it says the one who sows to the Spirit will from that Spirit reap those things that are all about the life that he wants to give us. The life that he wants for us and for those around us. Wow, that's incredible. Now, Let's go to verse 9. And let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. In due season. Let's not grow weary of doing what's right, of doing what's good, of sowing to the Spirit, right? Of investing our time and talents and treasures in the things that we ought to that really produce life. For in due season, you think, well, what's that season? In due season, what does that mean? What it really means is this that in the sovereignty of God, as he works all things together for good, for those who love him and are called according to his purpose, in God's sovereign and providential will, that he's working it out. Just don't get weary. Don't quit. Don't give up. Keep going. What's the option? If you quit and give up, it really just makes it worse, right? It just gets worse. But it's kind of, you know, we say to each other, hey, hang in there. That's what he's saying here. Hang in there. Because God is going to do what he is going to do, and you can trust him, but the timing is unique. It's what he's doing. Then look at verse 10. So then. So then. Let's circle it. It's an important one. So then. As we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Let's just stop for a second. Look at the pieces here. I think it helps us. So then, as we have opportunity, we cannot do everything always for everybody, right? We just don't have that much, that much resources. But as we have opportunity, when the opportunity comes, he wants us to invest ourselves in that which makes a difference. And let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Now you think, why did he make that statement? Couldn't he just have stopped with doing good stuff for everybody? Why did he make this statement? 
I think he makes this statement because he understands the household of faith, the church, is a tool that God wants to use to make a difference. I was sitting with a man just the other day among us, and he said, Kevin, I, I wonder how unconventional he wants us to be. And I thought, that's a great statement. How unconventional does he want us to be in order to make a difference? And I thought, I don't know for sure yet what that looks like. But together he will show us how unconventional he wants us to be to make a difference. So let me just go to this. Three things, just to kind of review, to kind of give the principle, but also to apply if we can. Uh, Three things that I'd like to talk about. Uh, about the grace of God and being very practical. First is this, that there are things that are too heavy to carry alone. There are some things that are too heavy to carry alone. If you have that, let someone else help you. If there's someone else carrying a load that it's way too heavy, let someone help you. Or if there's someone else, enter into their lives and say, brother, I would like to walk with you on this, travel, on this path for a while and tell the burden's okay. I'll help you carry it. Put a little bit on me. We can do it better together. There are some things that are just too hard. And I'll tell you what, I I have had so many people join me in this journey of life that have helped me so much through it. Some hard things, some difficult things, challenging things, discouraging things, heartbreaking things. And it's amazing. And we can do that for each other. But there are also some things that are our responsibility to carry. It's really our responsibility to do that. And knowing the difference is really the difference between dysfunctional and a functional understanding of life. So what are those things that God has called you to your responsibility to do, to grab onto, not require others to do for you, to not create, in a sense, a welfare system, not just financially, but a welfare system where We're doing for others what they can do for themselves. But what are the things that they can't do that we need to help them with? And what are the things that I can't do alone that I need your help with? I think that's the first principle. Here's the second principle. Is there is a, the time for sowing is now and always. The time for sowing, for investing, for planting seeds by our time and our talent and our treasures, that time is now and always to invest. But here's the deal, the time for reaping is in the due time of God's sovereignty. We have to trust him for that. We don't know for sure. Sometimes we, we sow or invest hoping that the return is very quick, right? Very quickly. I want it now and I want it, you know, big. Well, we can't count on that, how God works about it. He says, now is the time to sow and you just wait and I will bring a harvest. But that's his business. I was at a conference one time and there was a man speaking at this conference. It was in Kansas City. We had about, um, about 25,000 students there. Um, and this man spoke, and he had spent 40 years in Iran as a missionary. And he never saw one convert, not one, 40 years. I'm sitting there thinking, you're crazy. How'd you do that? Why'd you do that? But not too many years after he left and came home as a very elderly man, there was a movement of revival in Iran of thousands and thousands of people who came to Christ. And when they pointed back, it was because the seeds he had sown that God brought to harvest, and he didn't get to see it. He only got to hear about it. That is a faithful man. I was so impressed. He will bring it in his own unique time. I hope that encourages you to, as you sow in life, how we look for the results, but it comes when he says. In your relationships even, with people, in other ways, that he will bring it. Last principle I want to talk about. The priority of the church in this is not intended to be self-protective or self-centered. It's not. Though it kind of sounds like especially of the household of faith, it's not designed to be that. It is because of this. It is based on the conviction that the core answer in this world is Christ. That the core answer to the issues of our day is Christ himself. 
You guys, I'd like to read to you kind of an extensive thing. I, maybe some of you already read this this week. It kind of went viral. Um, but a guy named Ben Watson from the New Orleans Saints on Monday when he was preparing for his game uh, and the, the lack of indictment came out, he struggled and he wrote down his thoughts. How many have seen this? Okay, for those who haven't, this will be worth it. I think this is really well said. I think it's one of the best things that's been written so far. He writes this. At some point while I was playing or preparing to play Monday night football, the news broke about the Ferguson decision. After trying to figure out how I felt, I decided to write it down. Here are my thoughts. I'm angry because the stories of injustice that have been passed down for generations seem to be continuing before our very eyes. And I can identify with that. I remember my dad, my dad became the, he, he founded the Human Rights Commission in my, in my hometown of Colorado Springs. He fought this whole racial thing. He was the principal of the local downtown high school. And it's so hard for him to watch this divide. He hated that. I'll never forget when I was a, a, a kid, there was a, after the, the basketball game between his high school, the downtown integrated high school, and the high school my brothers went to, I wasn't old enough yet, uh, which was the country club on the hill. It was the white boy high school. Um, after the game, there was a full-fledged riot. People were shot. There's incredible things going on. And two guys, Wade Exum and Ernel Porche, were both convicted and sent to prison. And several years later, my dad was hosting a thing at our house for a group called Outward Bound. It's a kind of an outdoor education thing for developing character. And he said to me, Ernel and, and Wade are coming. I was like, in my heart, I'm going, Dad, what are you talking about? These guys started a riot. They spent time in prison. What are, you, are you nuts? Two African-American guys. Are you crazy? And he said, no, we've got to make a difference. And so they came in our house. I was like, wow. It was such a great learning experience for me as a kid. And I think that that's the same thing. But we keep seeing it happen over and over again. He's angry about it. He goes, I'm frustrated because pop culture, music, and movies glorify these types of uh, police citizen altercations and promote an invincible attitude that continues to get young men killed in real life away from the safety, movie, the safety of the movie sets and music studios. That's right. Next. He says, I'm fearful because in the back of my mind, I know that although I am a law-abiding citizen, I could still be looked upon as a threat to those who don't know me. So I continue to have to go the extra mile to earn the benefit of the doubt. It's true. I don't have to do that in West County. No one ever questions that, right? But an African-American does. He says, I'm embarrassed because of the looting, violent protests, the law-breaking uh, only confirm that in the minds of many, validate the stereotypes and thus the inferior treatment. It's true. He's embarrassed by that. He goes, I'm sad because another young life was lost from his, fa from his family. The racial divide has widened. A community is in shambles. Accusations, insensitivity, hurt, and hatred are boiling over, and we may never know the truth about what happened that day. It's true. He says this, I'm sympathetic because I wasn't uh, there, so I don't know exactly what happened. Maybe Darren Wilson acted within his rights and duty as an officer of the law and killed Michael Brown in self-defense like any of us would in the circumstance. Now he has to fear the backlash against himself and his loved ones when he is only doing his job. What a horrible thing to endure. Or maybe he provoked Michael and ignited the series of events that led him to eventually murdering the young man to prove a point. He says, I'm offended because of the insulting comments I've seen that are not only insensitive, but dismissive of the painful experience of others. It's true. He says this, I'm confused because I don't know why it's so hard to obey, to obey a policeman. You will never win. And I don't know why some policemen abuse their power. Power is a responsibility, not a weapon to brandish and lord over the populace. I'm introspective because sometimes I want to take our side without looking at the facts of the situation like these. Sometimes I feel like it's us against them. Sometimes I'm just as prejudiced as people I point fingers at, and that's not right. And how can I look at white skin and make assumptions but not want assumptions made about me? That's not right. Both ways. I'm hopeless because I've lived long enough to expect things like this to continue to happen. I'm not surprised, and at the same point, my little children are going to inherit the weight 
of being a minority and all that that entails. It's true. My next door neighbors are African American. And so I thought, what can I do in this situation? What should I do? I didn't know exactly, but I did know this, that when the government talks about creating programs that go top down, that it's never going to solve the problem. It's never going to really touch it. It only will happen from the bottom up and what we do and where I needed to start is not only in this congregation, for those who are of minorities, in this congregation that we need to embrace one another. I also know that my next door neighbor is an African American in a primarily white culture. And I just needed to somehow say, bro, and he is a bro in lots of ways. I needed to just find him in his, park, in his, in his driveway and say, Scott, I want you to know I've got your back. And I know you have mine. And he said, we do. But he said, but it is, he goes, it's hard because I know that I'm going to have to explain to Aiden, his son. He goes, I'm going to have to explain to him that there are going to be times that just because you're African-American, you're going to have to deal with things that your white friends aren't going to have to deal with. And I've got to teach you how to do that. And I thought, wow, it's true. He's going to have to teach his sons things I never had to teach my kids. And so I want Aiden to know that his white next-door neighbors simply love him and will have his back. Um, a couple of days ago, Di and I were at Hobby Lobby, <laughs> holiday thing to do. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, a friend of ours was working there, and uh, she was kind of giving these guys some directions on how to, uh, how to decorate and, um, the, the store. And they were on a break, and, I, and they were two African-American guys, and I just said, hey, you guys, I know that our city's going through a lot of stuff. And then she said, hey, you guys, this is my pastor. And I'm like, I said, oh, you know, I don't know if that's good or bad, but whatever. Um, and, and they said, wow, that's cool. And I said, I'm so sorry for what's going on, and we need to be a part of the solution. And they said, man, you're so right. Let's pray. And I'm like, <laughs> pray? What are you talking about? And so, and so the two of them just stepped forward, and the three of us are standing in Hobby Lobby holding hands praying. And I'm thinking, Okay, you know, whatever. And uh, so, so we're just praying. And those guys prayed like they meant it because they did. And it was really powerful. And then when they left, they said, well, where's your church? And I told them where. And I said, they said, what's it called? And I said, Quest. And they kind of looked at me funny like, Quest? What kind of name is that for a church? And I said, well, we're trying to make sure that the skeptic and the inquirer is welcome here and it doesn't build a, bri uh, a, a wall between them. And I said, we're trying to help make, make sure that we can relate to them. And the guy goes, man, that sounds like Paul. You guys want to be all things to all people so you can win the more. And I said, like, <laughs> well, you got it, man. You know, and, uh, so it was so fun. But the reality is that this is hard in this city. But he also says this, I'm hopeful because I know that while we still have race issues in America, we enjoy a much different normal than those of our parents and grandparents. I see it in my personal relationships with teammates, friends, mentors. It's a beautiful thing. But then he ends with this, and this is the point. I'm encouraged because ultimately the problem is not a skin problem, it is a sin problem. Sin is the reason we rebel against authority. Sin is the reason that we abuse our authority. Sin is the reason we are racist, prejudiced, and lie to cover, of our, uh, to lie to cover for our own. Sin is the reason we riot, loot, and burn. But I am encouraged because God has provided a solution for sin through his son, Jesus, and with it, a transformed heart and mind, one that is capable of looking past the outward and seeing what's truly important in every human being. The cure for the Michael Brown, Tavon Martin, Tamir Rice, and Eric Garner tragedies is not education or exposure, it's the gospel. So finally, I am encouraged because the gospel gives mankind hope. I don't know if anybody could put it better. And so when we say that we want to invest in the household of faith first, it's because of this, that we have been called to be a place of hope that the gospel gives. And so let me just review. What we've been talking about this morning is that we would, we would make sure that we carry each other's burdens when necessary and we carry our own, that we invest and we sow in our time and, tra uh, time and talent and treasures, the right things at the right time as God gives us opportunity and that he will bring a reaping when he chooses and we can trust him for that. And that as we invest in that, that the gospel is the hope of the world. 
The gospel is the hope of the world. And he wants to use churches, every church in this city, to make a difference. And that we would like to be a part of that. And I think what you're saying is that you would like to be a part of that. And say, okay, God, we'll do it. We're in. We're committed. And that's my prayer for us as a church, for us as people, that we would be all about doing what he's called us to do. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this particular passage that comes at a unique time uh, in the events of our city and the events of our lives. It's maybe not an accident. Father, would you give us a spirit as a group of people, both individually and together, that would you give us a spirit to carry one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ? Father, would you instill in us a responsibility to carry the load that you have given us that we ought not to give someone else responsibility for, to help us be responsible and mature people. Father, you've given us, though, so many things, and you've asked us to invest it, and to invest it well, and we'll trust you for when it comes to the harvest. That's your choice. That's your deal. It's not ours. And I know that you are about changing the hearts and minds of people. And so, Father, we can only do the, the sowing part. You do the reaping part. You do the harvest. And we will watch and we will give you thanks and we'll give you great glory for what you do. And Father, I pray that we would invest in this tool called the church, not only here, but every church, every movement that you will bless, that you would move, not only in this community, but around the world. Because it is the messenger of the gospel. It's a messenger of hope. It's the messenger of forgiveness. The fact that you sent your son to be the ransom for us. And for that, we really are grateful. And Father, we want to be about that. We're just a small little church. But your spirit is powerful and large and your glory is awesome. And Father, we pray that we'd be on that avenue. We'd be on that street walking with you to accomplish what you want to in us and through us. And we look forward to watching you work day by day, week by week, year by year. And so we give you thanks and we love you. We thank you for your great love for us. I thank you for the what you want to do in this city to break down the barriers that exist between city and county, between black and white. Would you break those down in our hearts first? so that we might be messengers of integrity for the gospel. We thank you for what you're already doing. We look forward to what you'll do more. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.